from UC Hastings. Uh, and um, her uh, talk last year, she was scheduled to give this talk exactly one year ago today. And of course, the fires were um, in, um, in progress, and we had to cancel that. So she was very gracious to come back again this year, and we're really excited to hear the talk that has been uh, a year in delay. So without further ado, let's uh, give the floor to me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and I'm really grateful to your professor, Professor Sons, for, um, for hosting me. And um, how many of you are pre-law? Some of you? A few of you? Anyone else think that they might go to law school at some point? Um, so I'm happy to chat with you more about the possibility. Hastings is a great place. We're in the center of San Francisco, really wonderful faculty. Um, we're close to all of the action, right next to the federal building, right next to the state courts. Um, Kamala Harris is an alumnus, uh, or an alumna. Um, uh, Willie Brown, former mayor of San Francisco, went to Hastings. Um, we have a lot of really, dis we produce distinguished and wonderful and, and I think impactful lawyers. Um, so afterwards, I'm also happy to chat with you more about the law school process or why you might consider my university. So today I'm going to talk to you about my research, which is on precarious work. Um, you might know that with the decline of the welfare state in the United States, almost all, um, all weight, state weight is put on employment regulation to remedy inequality. You have to work for the state to offer you any social safety net benefits. Paradoxically, employment aid and employment um, Benefits elude many U.S. workers. A growing number of workers are not considered employees under the law, but independent contractors who are ineligible for basic employment safeguards like the right to collectively bargain, um, the right to a minimum wage, the right to protections against employment discrimination, among others. This is sort of shows you what the regime of employment rights looks like in the United States. If you are an employee, you have um, Medicare, you have a pension, you have the prohibition against discrimination, you have um, the right to join a union um, to bargain with your employer, you have workers' compensation. If you work more than 40 hours a week, you get overtime. Um, this is just not the case for a whole group of other workers who are called independent contractors. They have no access to any of these things. So with the innovation and proliferation of business models intended to lower corporate costs by relying on non-employee labor, especially in what we call the gig economy, um, more workers are working without any basic protections. How many of you have driven for Uber and Lyft to supplement? Some of you, yeah. So driving for Uber and Lyft, if, if you got into an accident, you would not have access to workers' compensation in a way that um, someone who worked in a warehouse for Amazon might have access to workers' compensation if they were injured on the job. Um, social scientists refer to the growth of this casual workforce, so these independent contractors, as the rise of the precariat, um, a class of workers who relate, whose relationship to employment is precarious or risky because it lacks stability and the benefits of regulation. So in today's talk, I want to do three things. First, I want to help you understand how we got these two categories of workers. Why are all workers in the United States divided up into either employees or independent contractors? Um, in the contemporary moment, I think these categories have sort of become common sense. We just assume that, oh yes, um, there are these two categories of workers and that's how things are. Um, it's sort of a natural way to understand work. But when the legal regime regulating employment was passed by Congress in the 1930s, the distinction between employee and independent contractor was both unimportant and actually irrelevant for worker protections. Um, the second thing I want to do is talk about um, how this particular regime of um, work law, di this division between employee and independent contractors, um, how this shifted around uh, uh, in the taxi industry, how this shaped the taxi industry, the, the advent of these two worker categories. Um, 
I'm going to tell you what happened on the ground in, in the taxi industry in San Francisco, how unionized taxi drivers in the 1970s who had minimum wage and overtime protections um, became independent contractor drivers without union representations overnight in 1979. And how then in 2013, um, ride hail drivers working for Uber and Lyft operated with even fewer protections as independent contractors than taxi drivers did um, throughout much of, of um, the, late, um, the late 20th century. Finally, um, in part three of the talk, I want to show um, how these legal categories, how employees and independent contractors are much more than just legal categories. Um, they matter m m for more things than just the law. They have taken on social meanings for workers. Um, and I argue we have to take those social meanings seriously if we're to stabilize work across these precarious industries. So first part one, let me offer some historical background that shows how and why our employment and labor laws have gone from covering all workers to only some workers. Um, so why doesn't the law today cover all workers? Why don't all workers have access to the minimum wage um, and the right to organize and form a union? Let's start with what benefits employee workers have. Um, how many of you know what the New Deal is? Yeah? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about it? What you know about it? I saw some hands. If you're going to go to law school, this is going to happen every day. <laughs> Class participation. So um, the New Deal was a series of projects and laws instituted um, during the Great Depression by President Roosevelt and Congress, and it aimed to address the economic crisis of the early 20th century. Um, so beginning in 1935, many of the legislative reforms that were passed were aimed at supporting workers. So for example, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act in 1935, giving workers the protected right to organize um, and collectively bargain with their hiring entities to form unions. Um, in 1937, they passed the Fair Labor Standards Act to set a minimum wage and to establish a limit to the workday through overtime protections, to disincentivize employers from forcing workers to work for more than 40 hours a week. Um, why do you think that Congress decided that this was a good, good way to uplift the American economy and to save the lives and livelihoods of struggling Americans? Why unions? Why are unions important? What do they do? Have any of you ever been a part of a union? Family member part of a union? What do unions do? Well, if you go to work, if, you, if someone hires you, say I hire you, I want to hire you, and you really need a job. You have three kids. You have a rent to pay. And I say, hmm, I'm going to pay you $7 an hour. How does that sound? And you know in your mind that that's not going to be enough. But there might not be other jobs available to you. You might not have the power to say to me, I want more money. Because especially for lower skilled work, it's very easy for me to go to someone else and find someone else and say, I don't want to deal with you. You wanted more money. I can find someone else. So what unions do is enable workers to act together collectively so that they um, can bargain over a contract with an employer for wages, for overtime, for um, it would be much easier and much harder for you to come to me and say, you know what, I need sick leave. I'm sick and I need to take off. I might fire you. But unions, as part of their contract, frequently have rules with, regarding, with regard to sick leave. An employer under a union contract can't fire you if you get sick. You have to go through some sort of um, process in order to, to actually get fired. There has to be some just cause to fire you. Um, that's not true in the absence of unions. So this was part of the reason that Congress thought it was important to pass, um, to pass the National Labor Relations Act. To, get, to empower workers in the workplace to get the things that they need needed to, um, to have secure and stable work lives. So my research into the legislative history of these laws during the New Deal showed that they were not intended to be limited to just employees. 
in 1930, the 1930s, at the time of the creation of this, all the employment, almost all the employment regulations we have, except for the civil rights um, regulations, prohibition, prohibition against discrimination, which was passed in 1964, almost everything came out of this era in the 1930s. Um, workers during this time were not conceived of as either independent contractors or as employees. In fact, the category of independent contractor had never been extended to think about social safety net benefits that the state extended to workers. Um, in the legislative history, it was very clear everyone was referred to as an employee, whether they were newspaper, um, newspaper boys, whether they were taxi drivers, um, whether they were insurance salesmen, all these people that we now think of as independent contractors at the time were referred to as employees. Um, in fact, despite the protests of businesses, it really wasn't until the mid-20th century after World War II that in the realm of work and in social policy regarding workers that workers began to be conceived as either employees or independent contractors. And this duality was borrowed from another area of law, from tort law, and infused through congressional amendments into the New Deal. And, um, and all of a sudden, independent contractors didn't have the right to, to unions. Not only did they not have the right to unions, but if they tried to organize, they risked being charged with price fixing because they were small businesses who were fighting for a wage. And, and, and so they could be, um, they could be charged with, um, under, the, under the Sherman Act and, and under the Clayton Act, with antitrust violations, with price fixing. So I suggest um, that it, it, this was not a sort of a very particular, this wasn't a particularly controversial thing at the time. And I suggest that one of the reasons it wasn't controversial is because we were in a moment of high industrialism. We had a lot of factory workers. Most work was configured um, in such a way that people looked concretely like employees. Um, but what happened after these laws were passed is that more and more workers um, were made to look like they were independent contractors because it was a lot cheaper for employers to have independent contractors than it was for them to have employees. They didn't have to pay social security. They didn't have to pay for unemployment insurance. They didn't have to pay for workers' compensation. They didn't have to give people a minimum wage. They didn't have to pay overtime benefits. Almost 15 to 20% cheaper. It's almost 15 to 20% cheaper for employers to use independent contractors um, than it is for them to use employees. So um, while Congress, during the New Deal, sought to protect and balance the power between employers and workers, courts all of a sudden were being asked um, to determine whether or not some people were carved out of these protections. And the way that they did this was through um, the doctrine of control. The way, for the most part, this varies from law to law, but the way that you know um, legally whether someone is an employee is whether or not someone is controlled in the workplace. Um, does, who sets the hours of work? Who provides the instrumentalities of their work? Where is the work conducted? How integrated is the work into the hiring entity's business? I mean, in your heads, if you apply these, um, these factors to Uber, you see that some very clever attorneys figured out a way to have a workforce of independent contractors. Um, before Uber, however, taxi companies did this. So I began my research in the San Francisco taxi industry about five years before Uber and Lyft um, became popular. I was interested in how it was possible that in the United States, workers could work for 12 hours a day and go home with less than a minimum wage um, and sometimes even in debt. How is it legal to have work like this here in the US? Why did workers do this work if it was so unable and financially, un unstable and financially underwhelming? And taxi work, I think, is a particularly telling site for this invest investigation into the historic origins and contemporary legal and social meanings of this dual worker, um, these dual worker, worker categories. Um, today, ride sharing, as the next generation of taxi work, leads the technologically driven platform or gig economy with its legally um, contested use of independent contractor workers. But ironically, 
over 40 years ago, in the late 1960s and 1970s, taxi companies were among the first businesses nationwide to alter their business models by changing the legal identities of their workers to independent contractors. So while the nature of the taxi, um, ta uh, nature of taxi work remained the same, you know, you were still picking up people and dropping them off, taxi companies restructured their relationship to their workforce, demanding that they, instead of giving, instead of either sharing um, fares with workers or giving them a, a wage, um, what they did was demand, literally overnight in San Francisco, that workers lease their cars. They said, look, we'll take care of the insurance for the car, we'll take care of the upkeep for the car, and we'll take care of the car. What you have to do is pay us to work a shift. Give us $100, $150, pay for the gas, and any money you have that you make during your shift is yours. Um, this change to leasing the companies maintained gave the workers more control over their work and thus made them legally cognizable independent contractors because remember the less control an employer or a, a hiring entity exerts the less likely their workforce is to be made up of employees. Um, as a result of this industry-wide shift, many of the earliest legal decisions adjudicating this, these dual worker categories, making decisions, legal decisions about who is an employee and who is an independent contractor and what that means um, for the purposes of employment protections, actually involved an investigation into the work of the taxi industry. Um, so the San Francisco taxi industry in particular is a revealing case study and window into the implications of these dual worker categories on the ground. Um, drivers were unionized workers until 1979 and, uh, be and, and lost their union status because of the use of independent contractor business model. Um, they also immediately lost minimum wage, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, all of these things. And then beginning soon thereafter in the 1980s, as soon as they lost their employment status, a group of taxi workers um, who, who knew it was a lot better under the union, got together, and they formed a group that was known as the Alliance, and later as the United Taxi Cab Workers. Um, the United Taxi Cab Workers was not a traditional union. It's what some people now call, call an alt-labor group. Um, they were not a tra traditional union. They couldn't bargain with taxi companies. Um, they couldn't set wages. They couldn't um, they couldn't get things from the company, but by and large, because taxis are regulated by cities, what they did was advocate around policy issues with the city government to ensure that there was some security for taxi workers um, in San Francisco. So prior to the loss of union status, there were two things that the taxi union had secured for workers um, in the decades before. They had got a vehicle cap via medallions, which means that only, via the medallion system, only a certain number of cars were allowed to be on the road at any given time. Only, um, only for a long time it was, um, before Uber and Lyft it was about 1,900 cars were on, on, on the street at any given time. And each car had to have a medallion associated with it. Um, and the second thing was that they got the city council, what we call the Board of Supervisors, um, to regulate fares. They said this is good for consumers who otherwise can experience price, ga price gouging, and it's good for workers because they can predict how much money they're going to make if fares are regulated. And if the economy goes down, then we can go to the Board of Supervisors and say, hey, our, our workers are not making money. You have to raise the fares um, or, lower the, or lower the lease. The United Taxi Cab Workers actually tried many times to fight for employee status to get, convince courts and administrative bodies that they were controlled enough by taxi companies to be considered employees so that taxi workers could have the same protections that other workers, including UPS drivers. UPS is a union company. FedEx notoriously is not. Um, so that they could have the same protections that all these other workers have. They were never successful. Their failure in this regard had, had as much to do with the law as it had to do with taxi workers themselves, many of whom simply did not want to be considered employees, something that I'll get to in part three. So amidst these struggles in 2010, um, Uber Cab was founded in San Francisco. 
It was launched as an app for livery services, which connected passengers to existing licensed limos. Um, importantly, limos are actually regulated by the state of California, not by the city. Then in June 2012, Lyft launched an app with a different model, which altered both the ride hailing industry and its centuries old regulatory framework. Two traits were integral to the new apps, non-professional private drivers using their own cars and suggested non-mandatory price for the ride. And then a month later, in um, July 2012, Uber launched UberX as a similar model but with a key difference. Instead of a non-mandatory price, Uber set the fare. The state didn't set the fare, Uber set the fare, a trait that also distinguished it from taxis, whose rates were, again, set by city government. The city of San Francisco and the state of, actually, of California actually recognized that Uber was acting as a taxi company, but doing so illegally, outside the bounds of the regulatory framework, and they issued cease and desist orders. Uber and Lyft continued, however, defying the order and brazenly breaking the law. Eventually, they convinced state regulators that they were not a taxi company, but something new entirely, transportation network companies. They came up with a new term that, um, that the California Public Utilities Commission, the state body, um, took up and decided to use. They lobbied to have an entirely new set of rules apply to them. Now, um, do you think it's easier for workers to lobby their city government for rules and regulations in their workplace or the state? This is like come to Sacramento or, um, or, or and lobby sort of state assembly, state legislatures or lobby city council members? Cities, right. And so this is key to the, to the, um, to the logic of the whole on-demand gig economy. They have pushed to make sure that only states and not cities regulate their work. And so one of the things they got out of the state regulation um, was that these things didn't apply. There was no regulation of fares, and there was no vehicle cap. So these things that the union had fought for decades earlier were sort of gone overnight in this, in this industry. Um, these rules that were established by the California Public Utilities Commission were later replicated not just all over the country, but all over the world. Um, and countries all over the world now refer to these, to the, in their rules and regulations, now refer to these companies as transportation network companies. There have been a few countries that have defied um, the extraordinary lobbying efforts of these companies and said, no, no, we see that you are really just taxis. Um, but that, they're definitely in the minority. So by 2014, you had two industries doing the exact same thing, but operating under two very different sets of rules. So what did these shifts look like on the ground in the lives of workers, and how did workers understand their status as employees and independent contract, or as independent contractors? So all of a sudden, there were so many cars in San Francisco offering rides that full-time drivers, whether working for Uber or for a taxi company, couldn't make a living. Um, from 1,900 taxis in 2010, there were some 10,000 plus cars on the road at any given time. And you all understand supply and demand. Um, demand is finite, or sorry, supply is finite, right? So if you have, in this context, if you had, um, you have only a certain number of people who are trying to use these cars, but you have a surplus of workers who are trying to get work to give people um, rides. It's much harder to get fares and to get to make a living under that kind of those kind of economic circumstances. So, um, so by 2016, taxi drivers told me in San Francisco told me that their income was down by 75 percent. These are people who've been working in the industry for decades. Um, Uber drivers were making about the same amount of money that taxi drivers were making at the time, but m the difference is that many of the Uber drivers and Lyft drivers were not full-time workers. They weren't working 40 or 50 hours a week. This wasn't their full-time job. They were supplementing their income to make up for other workplace, workplace pathologies like just-in-time retail, which maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, so they were not relying on this work full-time. It was just a supplementary strategy. Now, employee status would give people a wage floor, 
It would give them the right to unionize. It would give them the right to workers' compensation. But throughout these many years, workers on the ground in my research have actually surprisingly been ambivalent about employee status. Um, the reasons differed from a taxi to Uber economy. Now, based on everything I told you, how many of you would prefer to be employees? And how many would you prefer to be independent contractors? Right, so um, in the pre-Uber economy, taxi drivers in San Francisco were really divided over the idea of being employees. Older white um, activist drivers wanted to be employees, and by and large, immigrant drivers, immigrant racial minority drivers wanted to be independent contractors. Now, I was a public interest lawyer bef before I went to graduate school, and one of the things I tried to do as a public interest lawyer was put together a case to have San Francisco taxi workers converted to be employees, because I thought, knowing what I did from my, my uh, law school experience, that that would help them in their lives. Um, I was surprised when drivers would tell me that that was not what they wanted. And I assumed that maybe they just didn't get it. Maybe they didn't understand the legal regime. Um, they had misconceptions about what it entailed. And I thought that more work needed to be done on the ground to educate them about the you know, important possibilities of being an employee. But my empirical research proved my assumptions as an attorney to actually be wrong. So rather than being a result of misconceptions about what it legally means to be an employee, immigrant and racial minority drivers' affinity for their independent contractor identity derived in part from valid concerns about control over their lives and dignity at work. So for white American board drivers in this pre-Uber world, the employee identity was key to better working conditions, and it sort of represented a glorious past in which driving was professional and respected. But for immigrant and racial minority drivers, being an independent contractor, particularly under a long-term leasing system, which had become more common, instead of going in and leasing your car for a shift, you could lease your car for a whole month. You could pay them like $5,000 and just take the car and not have to go in. Um, under the long-term leasing system, they didn't have to work shifts, they weren't subject to the often racist whim of management, and they could go and come from work as their transnational lives and families demanded. So in 2008, Tom Morrison became, this is, these are all pseudonyms, I don't use anyone's real name, Tom Morrison became president of the United Taxi Cab Workers. His first major campaign was to convince workers that they should be employees. And he and I actually put together a conference um, to educate taxi workers on the independent contractor status and how precarious it was and how they really wanted to be employees. Um, those who came genuinely curious expressed fear that being an employee meant that they would have to wear a uniform, um, that they couldn't stop to take a break when they wanted. Um, and these fears I learned in my historical research were actually ubiquitous among minority taxi drivers even in the 1970s, and it often pit they often pitted them against the union. Nevertheless, the UTW's response to these concerns was indignant and flippant. What are they afraid of, Morrison told me. The companies are going to make them wear dresses? Despite the failures of that particular con conference, UTW workers soldiered on, firmly believing that the solution of the contemporary problems for labor was to turn back the clock to an, era, um, to, an, to, the, to an earlier era. And they felt that a return to employee status was a solution to the taxi labor problem. Um, with the influx of immigrant workers and the increased diversity of the taxi workforce, white drivers generally felt that creating collective power was impossible. Um, in particular, they pointed out that immigrant drivers clung to illusions of their independent contractor status. So for example, Robin Gooding, um, a woman driver, one of the founders of the Alliance in the early 1980s and a longtime UTW advocate, reflected on the difficulties in organizing on the influx of immigrant workers to the industry. She wrote in an opinion piece, it's generally hard to organize first generation immigrants. Part of the problem stems from the fact that immigrants are generally coming from a less industrialized culture to a more industrialized culture. Their less industrialized cultures tend to have very different social structures. It's hard for new immigrants to perceive what the change is and means. Most third world drivers come from areas where there, were, there was no union or else the union was just another part of a corrupt oppressive hierarchy. So this is empirically untrue. Um, and to the contrary, my ethnographic research 
revealed that immigrant drivers did some of the most robust organizing of workers in the industry. They tended to avoid the employee independent contractor status. Um, but nonetheless, white non-migrant taxi worker advocates were unable to garner their collective power because, I argue, they discounted the views and desires and fears of the majority immigrant workforce around this idea of employee status. So um, immigrant and racial minority taxi drivers often had good structural and subjective reasons for clinging to, to their independent contractor identity. As one non-medallion holding Chinese American long-term lease driver told me, the long-term lease is always better because you always get the same cab, same location, no later than the fixed time. In the cab company, you have to wait for a long time. With the long-term lease, you can manage better with your private stuff. I can take my daughter to school. I can help with my brother's family. It makes a hard life easier. When my, when my mother died, I was able to lease the cab to my friends so I could attend a funeral in China. Simultaneously, immigrant taxi workers in my research resisted the employee identity, aligning it with dependence and powerlessness. The independent contractor identity, meanwhile, was imbued with the promise of cultural capital. Despite their insecure, beleaguered work lives, being independent contractors helped immigrant drivers to fulfill their role as good immigrants, making jobs as small businessmen as opposed to taking them as wage laborers. For example, when I asked Ashfaq Swapan, an undocumented Indian driver, whether he would want to be considered an employee, he vehemently said no, revealing that his sense of dignity was embedded in the notion that he was an entrepreneur. I like the small business entrepreneurial spirit. I don't mean to brag, but mostly customers say that I am the best driver they've ever had. Being an immigrant, I've had to make, it, make an effort to learn the language. American is different than Indian English. The customers say I'm very nice, kind, and helpful. I offer good customer service. This is my business practice. Um, we're already like slaves of the city. If we became employees, it would be worse. The companies would tell us what to wear and where to be. We couldn't stop and get coffee like I'm doing with you right now. We would lose our freedom. Drivers don't want to lose that. It's all we have. So here, Swapan invokes the word freedom to describe being free from the oppression of being an employee of having one's body submitted to the control of bosses, of having to wear a uniform, of being told what to do. Drivers, according to Swapin, were already slaves of the city, but they have the, had the freedom of imagining and aspiring towards something else. Unlike white American-born drivers, Swapin did not see this, his status as a small business myth, businessman as mythical. Rather, considering all the difficulties of his work, being a small businessman was all he had. It gave him a respectful identity in a job where he was largely disrespected. So as a taxi driver before the advent of Uber and Lyft, Swapin made more than the minimum wage and had no immediate family to support. He made roughly $35,000 a year. His income, due to fare regulations and vehicle caps in San Francisco, was predictable. Some days less, some days more, but fairly predictable. By 2015, however, after Uber and Lyft hit the streets and their business practices were legalized by the state of California, Swapin's income was decimated. He told me that his income had dropped so much that he wasn't sure that he was even going to make $15,000 that year, working 12 hours a day, six days a week. He left the industry and is working as an employee waiter right now. I wonder to what extent Uber and Lyft drivers felt differently than taxi drivers in the 2000s. And interestingly, my post-2015 research on Uber drivers revealed something similar. Roughly 60% of the drivers I talked to wanted to be independent contractors, but I didn't see the same division. Um, it cut across class, it cut, no, I'm sorry, not class, it cut across um, immigration status, it cut, cut across gender, it cut across um, uh, race, roughly 60%, no matter how you, how you sliced it, even full-time and casual workers, no matter how you sliced it, wanted to be independent contractors. Um, and for the drivers who wanted to be employees, it was very clear. They wanted benefits. Most of them worked full time. Um, they had families to support. The work was dangerous, so they wanted workers' compensation. They could be terminated by the app at any time, so they wanted to make sure they had unemployment insurance. Um, they wanted minimum wage protections, since there were days when they made much less than the minimum wage. But there were those, a simple majority in fact, who wanted to be independent contractors. 
And in contrast to an earlier moment in the taxi industry, these drivers were less concerned about cultural capital and the dignity associated with being um, an employee or being an independent contractor businessman. There were no such illusions. The app determined where they went, how much they were paid, and in many instances, how they behaved. Um, they were told things like, don't play foreign music in your car. Um, offer candy and water. I mean, their everyday lives or work lives were very directed in the way that taxi drivers' work lives were not directed. Rather, these workers, I discovered, were largely concerned that if they became employees, they would be even more under the thumb, even more controlled by Uber um, than they already were. For example, one driver who um, I call Paul is a 35-year-old internal migrant from Pikeville. I'm from Kentucky. Um, Pikeville is a poor mining town in Kentucky. And I asked him whether he wanted to be an employee. And I was like, you're from a mining town. You know about unions. You want to be an employee, right? And he said, well, maybe not me personally, because eventually I want to move on to another job. But it would be nice to be able to, like, uh, to have like, paid time off, though. But at the same rate, Uber's a horrible company. If they did have us as employees, they may be a lot more strict in terms of the customer feedback. Maybe if a customer gave us really bad fee feedback, they'd fire us. Like I had one customer last week who actually tried to get me fired because I didn't, I didn't take the route she wanted me to take. So Paul's answer is complicated. On the one hand, he wants the protections afforded through employee status. Specifically, he wants to take paid time off. Um, our conversation troubled popular assumptions of what workers mean when they say they want the privilege to work whenever they feel like it, which is what the companies tout. Um, they say our business models give workers the ability to work whenever they feel like it. It's flexibility. He didn't mean that he wanted to work whenever he felt like it. He meant he wanted to work whenever he could. Um, he had a mental illness that presented sporadically on unpredictable days. And on those days, he was incapable of working. He wanted income protection during those times, but he noted that, um, and he notes that that would actually be a positive aspect of being an employee. But he was afraid that if Uber were his employer, he would be even more at the whim and whimsy of the company, um, who might fire him based on a single customer's being, uh, feedback. So rather than being clear cut, his perspective on employee status is one of ambivalence. Either way, he fears exploitation. So I, I'm almost I, I'm at 1240. Is it OK if I go a little longer? It's fine. Yeah, okay. so, um, Kelsey Tillander is another driver that I spent a long time with who actively worked to organize Uber and Lyft drivers and wanted them to become Teamsters members. Um, he had worked as a unionized carpenter for many years, for most of his life, until he had been badly injured. Um, he actually said to me, you know, I used to laugh at those Walmart workers and say, why are you doing that? Why don't you get another job? And he said, now I get it. I can't get another job. Um, his wife, who supports him and his nine-year-old daughter, um, is a unionized longshore worker in the port of Oakland. The longshore union has um, historically been the most radical union in, um, in, in the East Bay, or in the Bay Area. So despite the fact that he knew all about unions, despite the fact that he had, uh, had been a member of a union, his partner was a member of a union, he didn't think that everyone should be an employee. He thought that, some, that there should be a two-tiered system, that some people should be employees and some people should be independent contractors. Nonetheless, he was a plaintiff in a lawsuit, a named plaintiff in a lawsuit that was suing to make Lyft drivers employees. So I asked him, um, you know, wh why, why do you want to do it? Like, why are you a named plaintiff in this lawsuit if you have this ambivalent status um, towards, employee, um, towards employment status? And he said, well, let me tell you a story. When Uber and Lyft started dropping their prices in, a, in the price war, and I just kept working more and more and more to where I'm going, I'm working 60, 70 hours a week. You know, over Christmas, I worked, what, 60 hours every week, but the last week of Christmas, and by the time all my expenses were done, I had $200 left over. So my family for Christmas presents got to go to Star Wars. That's it. No popcorn, you know, because it's $30 to go to the movies. That, was what, that experience is what motivated him to be in this lawsuit. Not because he hoped that they would win, but because he wanted to sort of enact revenge against this employer that was, in his, in his view, oppressing him. So despite the extraordinary wage insecurity and dissatisfaction, Ke um, Kelsey Tillander's position towards employment status, like Paul's, is that of ambivalence. It may or may not be for him, 
but in his ideal world, world, maybe it would be available. So where does that leave us? So I tried to denaturalize de these two worker statuses. How many of you knew that these were sort of the two legal work worker statuses that were out there? A bunch of you. So I tried to denaturalize these two worker statuses um, and show you where they come from and how they've impacted <coughs> workers in a single industry. And I've also shown you how workers have complicated feelings about their relationship to these identities, some very strong, some ambivalent. Um, despite the tremendous wage instability, some workers want to be independent contractors because they fear more extreme exploitation as an employee. So how do, does this, or how should this, these findings impact our effort to build a more robust economy with secure wage and decent work? Um, you'll recall from the beginning of my talk that this, this dichotomy is not how the New Deal Congress intended for benefits to be distributed and allocated. So I've argued in my work that this dichotomy is itself a distraction in the fight for secure work. The debates that have ensued among workers, among attorneys, among unions and legislatures miss the larger point. Workers need power and an advanced capitalist society in order to achieve some security. And power is not found in legal categories, but in real life, through worker organizing, worker mobilizing, and making demands of large corporations when workers are working together. And I don't mean to say that these conversations about employment status or all the hundreds of misclassification cases that have been fi that filed against these companies, I don't mean to say that they're not important, but that the fixation on employment status as the only means of fighting worker precarity, of building secure work, that that might itself be a red herring. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Do you guys use Uber and Lyft? Does anyone drive tax? Or, 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 everyone, anyone use taxis? <laughs> I do, and I can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you consider like Uber Eats and like DoorDash in the same realm of like what you were talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, again, it's part of the reason taxi companies were one of the first places that this kind of work proliferated is because you have to move around. So unlike in a factory setting where there's a supervisor watching you, um, in, with taxis, you're moving around. It's much harder to say that you're being controlled by, by the taxi company. And so part of what venture capitalists who invested in Uber and Lyft saw was an opportunity to exploit um, the idea of independent contractor labor. Um, Uber Eats and, and DoorDash, even though they're not transporting bodies, are doing the same thing, right? They are, um, they are considered by the companies independent contractors. It's, so you're not an independent, you're not an independent contractor just because a company says you're an independent contractor. It's a legal determination. But someone has to go to a court of law to say, hey, find me to be an employee or to be an independent contractor. And that, while that has happened, um, there have been lots of different procedural reasons that no decision has been made. Um, but yeah, DoorDash, Postmates, um, Instacart, these are all, in this, they're all using independent contractor labor. So the uh, so tax, they're all sort of later versions of taxi, taxi workers. Um, the, in addition to taxi work, the other place uh, where before the gig economy you saw the proliferation of independent contractor labor was um, in strip clubs. Exotic dancers literally one day in the 1980s were told, you're no longer getting a wage with tips. You, just like the guys who come in here, you have to pay us $40. And then you can keep all your tips. And so um, taxi workers, exotic dancers, um, often nail salon workers are considered independent contractors. They rent their space for a certain amount of monkey mon money. Um, also hair salon workers are independent contractors frequently. They rent their space from, um, and it, it's their business models that all are building on the same idea, that it's much cheaper for the business if they have independent contractors and not employees. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you could clarify the, uh, the timeline of workers' rights for taxi drivers. 
Sure. So it was um, about, so in about 1909, I didn't go over this, but 1909 is when the Chauffeurs Union was established in San Francisco. 100% um, of the taxi industry was unionized, and this was before the National Labor Relations Act. Um, so it wasn't through the same channels that you achieve unions today. Um, but they were 100% unionized. Um, then in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, not only did you get these, these National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act, but in San Francisco, you got the medallion system. So the, interestingly, the reason that we got a medallion system was because during the Great Depression, as during the Great Recession in 2008, you had so many people who were out of work, that you had tons of people trying to be taxi drivers. And so the city said, look, no one can make a living if we have thousands of drivers out on the streets. Um, we will um, establish this medallion system where you can't have a car on the street until, unless you have a medallion. Um, then during the 40s and 50s, the union fought for uh, fair regulation and, um, and got it. Then in the late 1970s, the taxi companies thought they would be um, they would follow the lead of taxi companies all over the country and say, you're not employees anymore, you're independent contractors. So in 1979, overnight, drivers lost their union, um, their union status. And then in the 80s, you had this organization, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, you had this organization that during hard economic times would fight. I mean, these were taxi drivers who drove 40, 50 hours a week. But, you know, for example, during 9-11, when tourism um, plummeted in San Francisco, they went to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and they said, please, please, please force the companies to, to lower our lease. So we're not paying $100 anymore, so they're paying $80. It's the only way we can make a living. And because the regulations were local, they could do that. Um, and then in 2013 and 14, you had this California Public Utilities Commission say, San Francisco, you're not allowed to regulate these new taxi cab companies, Uber and Lyft, we're going to regulate them, and we're not going to give them a vehicle cap, and we're not going to give them any fare regulation. They determine the fares, and they determine how many cars are um, allowed to be on the street at any given time. Um, and at that point, and you know, in sort of the moment that we're in, it's very hard for I've, I've I've spent a lot of time with drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers, who've tried to advocate for better working conditions. And they find they they really struggle because who do they direct their energies towards? I mean, Uber has closed doors. They literally can't access anyone. Literally cannot access anyone. Um, they um, they talk try and talk to um, city regulators, and city regulators say, look, under the California constitutions, we actually can't regulate Uber and Lyft because if some if the California Public Utilities Commission regulates an industry, we cannot regulate them. And so they've gone to the CPUC over and over again and asked for these things, but the CPUC also regulates so many different things, including gas, electricity, um, you know, limos. They, they have a huge mandate, and it's much harder to get them to shift and change their, their regulations for a statewide audience. And so that's sort of where we are. So use a taxi. <laughs> Wait for 15 minutes, totally fine. You can have a conversation. It was a pleasure to, to chat with you guys, and I, um, I look forward to lunch, and feel free to reach out to me.